All right, welcome everybody. We have a special guest today. My uh, good friend, Father Vladimir, has uh, brought one of his friends that he's known for a while. <clears throat> Her name is Dr. Veronica Androzova. And to be clear, she has a, uh, for, her bio says that she's a lecturer, translator, author of books. She's a doctor of theology and senior lecturer at Ugrishkaya Orthodox Seminary in the Moscow region. She taught at St. Tikhon Orthodox University of Humanities from 2010 to 2015. She's a doctor of theology from uh, Moscow 2013. She has two master's degrees from the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. 2016, she obtained an advanced master's in theology and religious studies from the Faculty of Theology. In 2019, she obtained a master's in educational studies and master's of science from the Faculty of Psychology and Pedagogy. She graduated, graduated from St. Tikhon Orthodox University of Humanities. She has a theology uh, as her main specialization, as well as others, such as classical languages and ancient Christian literature. She's a translator she, and the translator in the sphere of professional communication. She's the author of several books. And to, uh, today we're talking about the uh, heavenly books in the apocalypse of John uh, or no way. Is that a separate book or is that the book that we're talking about now? Now we're talking about apocalypse book of hope. Is that your book? Today, yes, so today's indeed. book is Apocalypse yeah. Book of Hope. I see that's 2021. Well, thank you, Veronica. I'm, I'm glad to have you here. Thank you, dear Jay. Thank you, Father Vladimir, for inviting me. Good to see you. Very, very happy that we finally meet um, with Jay and that this we've been working towards this meeting for quite some time. And finally, um, it began. And just a quick word not to interrupt and let you have the uh, just to let our viewers know that uh, we're hoping this is going to be a continuous uh, a series of uh, lectures based on uh, uh, your book that you wrote, I think, uh, in 2019. C could you speak, say a word about the book for a second and show it to us? Yeah, sure, Father Vladimir. So this is my last book, a fruit of my research that I was doing in several universities. So this is called Apocalypse, Book of Hope, written in Russian. And um, it is a, a textbook as well as a personal testimony about faith in Jesus Christ and biblical research. That's what I have been doing since 2009 when I graduated from um, St. Econ Orthodox University. I entered postgraduate studies and uh, my topic since 2007 already from my study time has been the book of revelation the last book of the bible and i enjoyed studying it in relation to all biblical books and the theological field um, christian church theology ancient as well as more than one and i'm really glad to be speaking here with you not in Russian, but in English. And uh, this allows me to address uh, my, uh, my the fruits of my research to a broader audience. So thank you for inviting me, Jay. Absolutely. Yeah, I can't bless. wait to see the book in English. I, I want to read it. Yeah, and Veronica and I are um, working on translation of the book. Uh, she, as you can see, her English is is very very good, and uh, she got her um, master's degrees in English. So it uh, makes my job of trying to help uh, with translation a lot <laughs> a lot easier. Uh, mainly uh, just kind of collaborating on that, but most of the work is done by. Uh, by Veronica, and uh, it is a beautiful systematic approach to uh, Apocalypse. That's why it lends itself so well. As she mentioned, it actually is a format of lessons. So we have um, a kind of structure that will hopefully uh, allow our viewers to uh, go step by step, um, a lecture by a conversational lecture by lecture, that we can go into this very um, beautiful and complex um, uh, biblical text um so maybe um veronica wants to add something to that before we begin uh, yeah i hope that our talk will initiate a series of talks and our work on translation will go hand in hand with it so that we could share uh, the things that we are working on currently and it's a pleasure for me to collaborate with Father Vladimir in this um, exciting project, like making uh, the theological thought more accessible to broader audiences who are interested. 
Thank you. Uh, and there was some quick mention that uh, we and uh, Veronica and I were part of the same university while I uh, years ago was a student at the St. Tichon University. And I'm really uh, happy that we're finally beginning to share this uh, to our English speaking um, audience. Uh, now, did you want to start with the questions? Did you want to ask the first question, Father Vladimir? Did you want, did you want me to go first? Um, uh, yeah, I could. I could um, definitely um, begin uh, with the question that I think is uh, very, very much on the tip of everybody's tongue: as um, why do you think this book is so famous and? Um, also, why there are uh, the, what common stereotypes um, are associated with it? Because we uh, we almost uh, uh, have the the word apocalypse associated with uh, uh, um, I would say globally uh, for pretty much any person, any culture, um, with something I would say just mildly put negative. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for the question, Father Vladimir. Indeed, the apocalypse is a word that is basically on everyone's lips in, during many centuries, many generations, apparently. And uh, this word comes from the last book of the Bible. I don't think everyone that uh, uses this word so actively has actually read this last book, but nevertheless, it is really well known among other biblical books. And I think uh, people that have some kind of uh, superficial knowledge, they know that this book has breathtaking imagery in it. So the huge battles between good and evil forces, uh, this uh, thriller-like um, plot, and uh, indeed images of catastrophes, of annihilation of the world, that we knew it. And I think this uh, topic, the end of human world, indeed attracts attention of many people because it can be said as a grandiose event, the main event, actually, the, the, the end of the whole history. And um, yeah, I think um, it, the specific feature of this book, uh, indeed, is that there are so many interpretations of it throughout the ages. And uh, even Saint uh, Jerome back in 5th century said that Apocalypse has as many mysteries as there are words in this book. So even in those times, this book was considered something mysterious um, that is very difficult to penetrate into. So this kind of atmosphere of um, mystery uh, is present in the book because also we cannot read in it exact predictions well, probably people really wait for this yeah like, like we open and we can see prognosis of the end time events uh, step by step how it would unfold and no it's not the case because there is no really clear uh, points that uh, one can read. So there are uh, general depictions of wars, like uh, cavalries, uh, locusts that are really pernicious, but who are they? Who, who is this uh, majestic beast? Who is this dragon? You know, seven heads, seven horns, um, Harlot Babylon, like this is very ambiguous. You can relate it to any, any, any <laughs> anything, any contemporary event also. Uh, or some theological ideas. I think this book is um, very popular because of this combination of very important issues present in it discussed, like the end of the world, the good and evil forces, and these blank spaces that people can fill in as they would like to. And it, it's very um, sad sometimes to see that people actually read in so many different <laughs> ideas that, that they want people to believe in. Was I think we have over and over throughout history and um, in the mo modern age and very much throughout the history of Christian church uh, or c culture, 
uh, we have attempts to um, read into this book in literal sense, which, uh, as you mentioned, makes it almost impossible because of the uh, phantasmagoric imagery that uh, clearly um, raises a question of where are those uh, um, things that are written about, while at the same time people still um, bring up uh, and try to use this book as a clear sign of the time or of, of whatever is happening mm-hmm. right now. Um, I guess we could talk about that further down the line if you want to add a little mm-hmm. bit to that uh, now. Yeah, please. so the, the, there are two trends, mm, as I see it in relation to this book. Uh, the first one is that people actively use it to agitate the others to see that uh, here it, uh, it is, the end of the world is happening right now. Behold, there is the beast and um, the, 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 this time that you awaited uh, has come and now uh, the prophecies of the apocalypse actually are coming true. Um, and then they don't have in mind uh, or that uh, this approach means that all previous generations that interpreted this book uh, are deemed as false, <laughs> so that the, the, they uh, shared false interpretations and only our generation finally can have an access to the right ones. So I think it, it's, it's too strong a claim that they make. And other people seeing that these predictions of the end of the world doesn't uh, turn out to be true. So the course of life just continues as it was after this proposed date uh, for the end. They say, oh, maybe we should leave this book aside. So it, it, it says about some remote future that has no direct uh, relation to us. As Christians, so let us nourish our Christian faith through other New Testament books and leave just this one on the shelf somehow, because uh, there is enough alarming things and anxieties in our times. <laughs> not, not, not to, to take uh, this book, it's already much negativity there. Uh, these two trends uh, can be called extremes. But in fact, they share basically the same presuppositions, the same stereotypes. I would name the first one that Apocalypse uh, is reduced um, as saying only exclusively about the end of the world, which is not the case. If you even read it once from the beginning till the end, you will see that it's not only, it's not the only topic that Apocalypse tells about. And the second stereotype uh, connects Apocalypse only to something negative and gruesome, uh, troublesome and maleficent, but uh, Apocalypse indeed has very bright pages in it. And in my approach, in the church approach, we choose to focus exactly on these passages that speak about Jesus Christ, about the church. So this theological approach is what I'm taking in my research, following many, many Christian interpreters from different centuries and from 20 and 21st century also. So I'm really enjoying uh, this uh, research and the uh, fruits that it can bring. Like spiritual ones. Thank you, thank you. Maybe Jay, do you do you want to uh, ask a question? Maybe in this yeah. Time? Well, I'm curious. Um, wh- what piques your interest uh, on this topic? Because it's it's not a topic that most academics and scholars or even people into theology go into. You know, it's something that kind of um, a lot of Protestants and evangelicals get really into it because they have these, you know, premillennial type views. Uh, so I'm curious, what, what got you interested in this? Why did you pick this to be your focus here? Ah, you mean why I have chosen this book for my research? Yeah, since it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's not common for academics and even the theologians to focus on this topic, what, what piqued your mm-hmm. interest to choose it? Ah, well, uh, the first time I studied this book was at the special course, elective course in St. Tikon University. And I wanted to follow biblical studies, so to choose it as my specialization. And uh, my promoter said that he has collected a lot of literature deliberately on the apocalypse, so it was his interest. Uh, 
And uh, he said that he can assist me in doing this kind of research. And I said, well, okay. Uh, so I didn't have this uh, prefixed idea that I would do the apocalypse as such. But uh, when I remember myself in teenage years, when I became a believer, uh, like uh, 14 years old, I remember reading a very small book uh, with a commentary on the apocalypse, very short one, but it, it gave me this taste of grandiose events and Jesus Christ coming into the world. So kind of I was <laughs> already somehow a little bit familiar with this book and it gave me really good insight into the Bible itself. So I would like to develop this issue that Apocalypse indeed combines uh, the Old and the New Testament um, as it is and uh, can be really called the last book of the Bible in this way, like a summary of those. So uh, the question that is uh, here is uh, the way I would uh, ask this. My understanding, my research when I've looked at the apocalypse for a long, I mean, obviously I'm not, I haven't studied as long as you, but it has been a topic I've been really interested in for many years as well. And uh, the first thing that kind of cured me of my Protestant presuppositions uh, and upbringing where I had a really kind of a premillennial end times view of this book was to understand that this book can't be understood apart from liturgy or liturgical worship, particularly the ancient, you know, Israelite temple liturgy, where we have all this imagery from the temple that's present in the apocalypse. And so the next question is, why are there so many uh, sort of odd visual imagery, imagery, imagery and symbols? And, um, you know, maybe one of the keys to begin decoding the book would be the liturgy itself, and particularly the Hebrew liturgy. Is that is that your take? Yeah, thank you, Jay. Well, I think uh, there are many uh, there are many researchers in twenty and twenty first century who are really interested in the apocalypse and uh, very believing ones as well who combine this um, pure scientific approach, scholarly approach, and also the motivational one. And uh, I, uh, there is quite some literature, I think. So this book is not somewhere at the back of the New Testament scholarship and. Uh, yeah, current church movements, they tend to maybe um, absolutize some part of it. For example, chapter 20 with this millennial reign of Jesus with the saints. Uh, but uh, scholarly approach allows us to, to have more broader of a picture, as you said, connecting with the liturgy or connecting with the uh, Hebrew background, especially with the Old Testament text, which is, I, I mean, uh, the most important source that we should heed when speaking about the apocalypse. So this, all of it should be present in a very, right. uh, very balanced way. Because sometimes when I um, say to my acquaintances that my research topic is the book of Revelation, I get the question like, oh, oh, oh you then should know when the end of the world right. will occur. So that, that I'm laughing and saying that it's not my field, it's not so what, I, what I'm doing. I uh, go uh, indeed into this historical cultural background right. as a researcher and uh, indeed literary and um, Jewish tradition. And uh, this is not, not the less exciting, <laughs> I want to say, uh, because the, uh, this approach allows us to extract the ideas from those images and uh, indeed uh, to see what meaning those ideas had for the people or for the addressees or the first readers of the apocalypse and then it can be retranslated into the ideas for the 21st century so that's what our, our humanistical approach also is doing and the, the question that you asked why so many images and it, it's a bit <laughs> it seems a bit overboard too much for us especially if we compare the apocalypse with the other new testament books so we, we don't have another one of this kind so it's mainly historical narrative about jesus's are the Gospels or uh, epistles of the Apostles speaking about the life in a community, how to structure it, the moral issues. So nothing really similar to this kind of um, fantastic, um, bright, vivid uh, pictures as we have in the Apocalypse. Indeed, it was a choice of the author, but the author wasn't alone. He was not like in the desert somehow. He wasn't writing from the top of his head because if we open the Bible in its entirety, we will see Jewish scriptures, Old Testament books that are exactly like this. So, for example, the book of 
uh, Ezekiel, a prophet Ezekiel, or Isaiah, some parts of it, or Daniel, of course, and uh, uh, Zechariah. So several jo Joel, so, um, uh, prophets of the Bible, they have uh, very large fragments of the same style, as you say, visions. And um, yeah, familiarity with the Old Testament would allow us to look at the apocalypse as a less weird <laughs> piece of literature. So that it indeed stands in a certain tradition and draws upon a lot of images that were already familiar to uh, the people who were versed in the Old Testament text. So we assume that the audience of John, the author of the apocalypse, were somehow familiar with the Old Testament. Or, or some church teacher could explain uh, all these connections and intertwinements. So I want to stress that Apocalypse is not a kind of esoteric literature that you need someone to introduce you, to initiate you uh, right. to understand it, but you can just on your own, read Old Testament, read the commentaries, and uh, you will just look uh, on the Apocalypse with different eyes, with different level of understanding. And uh, the, my point also is that uh, it is such an interesting book because uh, it's not esoteric, but it's a closer to an artwork. Yeah. Because uh, you, you cannot um, explain an artwork in a total way. So when you even give a two hour lecture on some painting or sculpture, you still do not say everything that can be said about this work because our human words cannot express you know, something that you still sense. So something indeed is left unexpressed, unsaid. And that's why Apocalypse is so rich. And yeah, many artists drew inspiration from it. Well, yes, um, and as someone who works with art, uh, art history, particularly in uh, church art, I uh, we we definitely can see thousands uh, uh, of images that are drawing inspiration, or sometimes are just direct illustrations of or attempts to directly illustrate those uh, visions that are described in Apocalypse, and um, we. Um, uh, uh, we can go through different centuries and we can go through different uh, styles of art. Um, it would be um, almost uh, uh, impossible to imagine um, religious art if Apocalypse wasn't uh, present in the book of the Bible. As you, you speak of the apocalyptic uh, genre um, in your um, answer to the question of uh, apocalypse being something not, I would say, unique, but uh, almost the, the term apocalyptic genre has emerged because apocalypse has been uh, the most known and the most uh, fa uh, fa most famous uh, form of that genre, and even maybe one of the most uh, incredibly written of all. So it kind of bears that uh, title. But exactly as you said, it was present in the Old Testament, but um, Old Testament uh, imagery almost bears this... Uh, a sign of uh, Old Testamental um, approach where uh, in the Old Testament tradition, the depiction of uh, or art itself wasn't as um, welcomed per se, uh, which we get a lot in a, a kind of classm uh, sort of uh, conflict with the Protestant position that sort of starts to take us back to the uh, presupposed uh, idea that we cannot portray anything at all, which isn't uh, obviously not, which is not true. Um, uh, so if we talk about iconography versus classical or uh, more worldly representation, or maybe if you will, Western formats of art, um, what could you say about the apocalypse in that context? The yeah, book. As you said, indeed, uh, the apocalypse as a narrative, as a source of imagery, had had a great impact on European art, especially of Western uh, art, so some Eastern as well. Uh, for example, yeah, in Italy, like uh, Santa Maria Maggiore, uh, Santa Prasede, and um, in France, uh, this uh, famous uh, Saint Chapelle. Uh, so there are uh, huge art pieces uh, of uh, apocalyptic 
um, imagery and um, uh, tapestry, tapestry of angels also in France and in Russia. I think from 16th century, apocalypse uh, grew um, popular somehow in different church uh, trends. And uh, yeah, we can see, for example, uh, frescoes, uh, very beautiful ones in Novgorod. Rostov, so many, many cities. And I liked the um, conclusion of uh, our historian of, uh, of, uh, who, who really um, did a lot of work in studying the images of the apocalypse and uh, art. And uh, she said that there is no verse in the book which hasn't been illustrated somehow in some way, in some form. So this is what really inspires me that uh, this book uh, grew indeed so deep into European uh, culture, so um, uh, over the world. And uh, even, you know, the symbol of European Union, 12 stars, uh, is said to be originated from chapter 12 of the Apocalypse. So the woman clothed in the sun with a crown of 12 stars. So this is even till modern times, the traces remain. Well, yeah, and as you mentioned, um, in um, uh, architecture, there has emerged a certain time, there has emerged a trend of painting uh, the scene of the Last Judgment. As uh, yeah. we have seen one mm -hmm. in the West, we've seen definitely one of the most popular of that example of the examples is in Sixteen Chapel that pretty much every person heard of. Um, and uh, the there was also an interesting positioning of that scene. So in some cases, it would be in the Eastern tradition, it would be positioned um, uh, on the, I believe, on the back uh, wall of the church. Uh, as people were leaving, they would yeah. uh, be reminded of uh, of the scene of the Last Judgment as a kind of a last thought that they had after the Divine Liturgy. Mm -hmm. um, they would be walking into a kind of m constant uh, memory, but even sometimes uh, the portrayal of that uh, could be interpreted as, uh, you know, instilling certain sense of fear. Even in um, um, a movie, Andrei Rublev, that uh, we're currently in parallel with this uh, series, we're uh, very s synergistically working on a series with um, Andrei Tarkovsky. And there's this amazing scene uh, uh, in the field uh, when uh, uh, the iconographer and his uh, and his master, his teacher, uh, elder um, among See, they're they're having this conversation, almost heated conversation about the theme that uh, uh, Andre says we we should uh, not uh, paint the the horror. We should uh, show people that God is love and. Um, Almost like as he says, you were saying blasphemy. If anybody heard you, you would, you know. Do you think that that was a form of um, bringing people uh, into a kind of uh, submissive, fearful state on purpose? What do you, what are your thoughts on that? And in, in this huge mural type of context, you're looking at the back wall of the mm -hmm. entire church, a cathedral. Yeah, it could be interpreted as uh, this, so really it's to subject people in, in some way, but also uh, to remind them of their responsibilities. Yeah, so it, it can be twofold, I think, and it depends how, um, what, what kind of a religious model did uh, that people have in their minds and their hearts. So I don't immediately read it as uh, some subjection. Uh, and indeed, such such issues of ambiguous theological looks on God really come up very often in discussions related to the apocalypse. And some theologians are quite negative uh, in relation to this book, saying that is um, uh, really Old Testament-like in um, how to say bad way, <laughs> in in uh, in a sense that mm -hmm. it is uh, like a step backwards from the message of love and peace that Jesus taught, and there we see God as. Uh, punishing people, so a very majestic city and his throne and um, judging uh, people. But um, yeah, for me, it is really a challenge. So how you can uh, see love in all these kind of threatening and um, fearsome pictures. So this is like a quest that uh, scholars are doing, which do believe that apocalypse is an integral part of the New Testament. And so Jesus Christ, what, what uh, it is portrayed there is the same, the same Jesus that we encounter on other New Testament books and their pages. So, and uh, mm -hmm. this is the, like a hermeneutical principle that 
uh, Christian scholars adopt, and I uh, do adopt also in my book. And uh, it, it allows, as the uh, Holy Father said, uh, to uh, illuminate the difficult, um, difficult places in the apocalypse as well as the difficult places of the Old Testament, for example, holy war and violence inflicted by uh, people of Israel and other nations. So for me, it's really a challenge that is uh, very interesting to solve and to provide people uh, with uh, solid theological background. So for example, if Christians encounter an atheist who would uh, really uh, challenge uh, these pictures of God, then uh, they should have some kind of a solid argumentation to uh, counter it. Maybe not to convince, but just uh, yeah, to uh, say something meaningful and uh, say that uh, the Bible is uh, coherent. So that there is the same spirit of God in, on the pages of the Bible. Well, um, just to kind of stay a little bit longer on this question, maybe you have a, a an answer to as the difference as the portrayal of the uh, uh, the apocalyptic scene of the last judgment being on the back wall in the Eastern tradition. And now it moves into the front uh, wall, so you're actually during the service, divine service, or be be it the the mass in the Eastern in the Western um, Latin Church. Uh, people would be facing the images of uh, of the last judgment, while um, that again would bring them to. Uh, uh, so there was a conscious focus on some kind of uh, um, you know message that's being sent uh, in in that sense. Do you think it um, in in some way reflects the theology of the Eastern and the Western Church? And I don't think that occurred. Uh, chronologically after the schism, I think that the, this may have been a practice that lasted much, much earlier, that started much, much earlier than the schism itself. Can you uh, comment on that nuance of the placement and the meaning? No, it's a good question. I don't have an elaborated opinion on this. Uh, but yeah, maybe it, it depends how you see maybe that uh, what, what you see in front of you could be interpreted by church readings as something maybe uh, diminishing the um, uh, fearsomeness of the picture or uh, the other way around, maybe what you um, see all, all the time in front of you could affect you more than what, what you were seeing uh, only by a moment you're leaving the church but maybe uh, on the other hand maybe uh, something that you saw at the very end as you said father vladimir would, would impact you more than <laughs> anything else so i, I don't have an, uh, okay. some okay. Uh, yeah, solid I just, I, I was yeah. Curious, and I'm sure these traditions mm -hmm. we can go deeper into these um, mm -hmm. nuances of the yeah, it's also theologically the, relevant indeed the, 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 how, how it was they, structured the church space yeah yeah we we definitely have the you know the topography the organization of the sacred mm -hmm. space is is a whole as a whole system of perception within uh the uh, space of worship because you can't just separate image from um the viewer and the viewer's experience and uh, also other mm -hmm. faculties like sound and uh, music and um and the poetry and the, and the hymns everything comes together in in this sense so um it does definitely uh affect us while we are in the space of worship and on another note of the art uh, we're talking about uh, illustrations that taken uh, in in a period when the printing press uh, uh, was uh, emerging and the um, reformation be was beginning we have one um, kind of uh, I think notable phenomenon with Albert Durer's uh, uh, series and apocalypse uh, his uh, illustrations uh, begin to flood uh, European perception because of their of uh, the new technology uh, uh, we're experiencing that kind of exposure to the images um, and while people were still illiterate in many sense they could see uh, those engravings by a great master uh, Albert Durer that um, he did right around the time when one of the perceived uh, apocalyptic uh, uh, prophecies was to be actually coming true I think in uh, around the year 1500 it was uh, believed by all of Europe that uh, the end is near and we're going to be um, seeing the events of apocalypse so his timing was impeccable as as impeccable as his mastery and his work 
and uh, those images they almost became iconic uh, um, compositions that drew on uh, older iconographic uh, uh, culture but they also have transferred then into um, even orthodoxy uh, I know we find uh, mm -hmm. some of the images in on Mount Athos in uh, uh, St. Dionysius Monastery or Factory where they have uh, in a place where they actually partake of their food the monks uh, would have these images of apocalypse all across these these frescoes that uh, have uh, been influenced by by those uh, um, engravings that of course uh, were easy to share and move around and 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 they made their way in, in, into um, one of the spiritual centers of Orthodox uh, tradition the Mount Athos indeed. Oh, maybe to the next uh, theme of our conversation. Jay, do you do you want to? Yeah. So the uh, going back to something that was said a little bit earlier. Um, you know, I really liked that you <clears throat> pointed out the stress uh, on the continuity between uh, what's in the Old Testament, the Torah, you know, the prophets, and the revelation that we have of Christ in the Apocalypse. For example, one thing that really sticks out to me, which I think is really uh, deep and insightful when you get into it is the the way that Jesus is presented when he appears in the first chapter is very similar to the description of Ezekiel's rider on the chariot. And so it's almost a parallel of this son of one, like the son of man in Ezekiel one to Ezekiel 10, who's um, you know portrayed as the uh, likeness of the divine glory, all these divine titles. And then when Christ appears in, in uh, Revelation 1 to John, and John falls at his feet, which is that imagery from the book of Daniel, where Daniel falls <laughs> down as well. Um, but in this, in, in Daniel's case, I think it's contrasted with what happens with John, because John isn't just talking to a mere angel, but one like the Son of Man as well. And so the, the revelation of the person of Christ is kind of in the very beginning, that revelation, that apocalypse, that, that unveiling is of the same figure who's throughout the theophanies in the Old Testament, who is the angel of the Lord, who is one like the Son of Man. And so if we know, like you said, our Old Testament and that it's Christ that's present in all these theophanies in the Old Testament, then we would know that it's a perfect continuity with the figure who's appearing in the apocalypse. Yeah, indeed. And I think this is very telling and very important. As Father Vladimir already mentioned, that there was an apocalyptic genre, as uh, modern scholars define it. And uh, actually, the word uh, ap apocalypsis in Greek means revelation or disclosure. So this kalypto means to hide, and uh, this uh, prefix apo means uh, the move in opposite direction. So, indeed, disclosure of heavenly mysteries as Daniel experienced it. So, it was really some you know, supernatural knowledge and visions that were shown to him. And Apocalyptic genre is um, indeed uh, known for this uh, visionary style. A lot of angels appear and uh, can explain what the seer sees. And uh, only really uh, pure in heart servants of God could see heavens open and learn how things are in heaven and uh, how God directs uh, the universe. Uh, and uh, so this is like a, a revelation upwards. And there was also a component of a revelation forward, uh, so to say, eschatology. So last things to the end of the world. And it's not as such the end. Uh, but the end of all evil that permeates the world that destroys the creation. So that was really an issue that was burning um, and pressing for the apocalyptic writers. And uh, as, as, we as we compare apocalypse of the New Testament with other representatives of the genre that is from the Bible and from Second Temple literature of Judaism, also many, many examples of it, we can see many common features as well as differences. So, for example, uh, we can see symbolism of angels, animals, numbers, uh, heavenly mysteries and uh, worship of God. But also in no uh, Jewish apocalypse, uh, the Messiah is such a central figure as uh, in the New Testament apocalypse. And so no angel, but uh, the uh, Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, th this is very telling because 
uh, the main character of many uh, of the apocalypse was the seer, so the servant of God. But uh, here in our apocalyptic writing, uh, John deliberately stands uh, backwards. So he, he creates all the room for the main figure of his narrative, uh, Jesus. And it is a scene uh, in the very beginning. So if you uh, read, maybe we should, we should read Father Vladimir verse 1, so the, the opening of the mm -hmm. book. Uh, yes, the, um, we will um, begin with the first verse mm -hmm. of the book of the Revelation. Uh, the, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. We can focus on the first opening word, which is Revelation, so Apocalypse. Yeah, and uh, we can see that it is not actually the revelation of Saint John, as uh, this book is commonly called, but revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, this is very telling because this book is focused mainly on Jesus. And um, um, it is also important that uh, this uh, Greek term, revelation of Jesus Christ, can be interpreted in two ways. So revelation by Jesus Christ that he gives and revelation about Jesus Christ that tells us about him. And it is very neatly combined in the narrative. So what, what, what Jesus tells us, oh, all kinds of moral teachings, theological, um, very relevant for our lives. And also what uh, Jesus himself is, who is he? And we see Jesus as a uh, really divine figure in the apocalypse. So this is a very special feature of this book, this majestic, uh, godly-like splendor of Jesus. And this is already in the first chapter. And in the last uh, section of the book, Heavenly Jerusalem, uh, Jesus as a lamb um, in the center of the, uh, the city, uh, spreading life to all the corners of it with God together on the throne. And also in the key point of the narrative, Jesus is present, that is the move from earthly plane to heavenly realm, uh, chapters four and five, Jesus as a lamb. And uh, this image of Jesus is really decisive for the apocalypse. It is used 28 times, uh, this word lamb, for Jesus. This is also very prominent to show that this is the same loving Jesus who sacrificed his life for uh, the humankind. And uh, yeah, so this um, presence of Jesus throughout the entire narrative convinces us that the main topic of the book actually is not any beast or antichrist or some evil figure, but Jesus himself who fights the evil, who saves his world, his believers from this um, very sad and uh, depressing reality that uh, surrounds them. So this um, atmosphere uh, that is created in the apocalypse is close to other apocalyptic writings and also to the Gospel of John, actually, because this uh, opposition between good and evil, between uh, truth and lie, um, light and darkness is uh, really specific to the Gospel of John. This like black and white positioning of the reality is also something that uh, is uh, typical for the apocalypse. So we can see, you know, all kinds of relations when we even discuss the first <laughs> verses of, of the book. There's a... Uh... An interesting parallel too, where John here is. Uh, I want to ask your thought on this. It's kind of parallel to uh, Moses in the Exodus, because when Moses uh, goes up on the mountain and he sees one like the Son of Man, he sees the um, him standing on a sapphire, you know, uh, uh, plane, and he, according to Hebrews, is given the in the Greek the tupos, the types of the things in heaven to put into the tabernacle and in the temple. So the revelation to Moses is supposed to be an image or a type of the things that he's seen in, in heaven. And then John is doing the same thing where he sees this, this uh, angel, of the Lord, who is the logos as well. When in chapters four and five, when he sees into heaven, and he sees this worship service. So he's kind of like a, uh, a parallel to Moses, at least the way I've read it. Do you, do you see that as well? That 
just as Moses saw the son of God in heaven and is, you know, putting the types uh, into the, the tabernacle worship, John is seeing the son of God in heaven, but he's not putting types. He's actually bringing the heavenly worship to, to reality in the liturgy. Yeah, it's an interesting turn that it's uh, indeed what is happening in church life, what John sees in heaven. So this worship that John testifies that he saw. I think uh, this um, um, this tension between heavenly and earthly realm is very typical to the apocalypse. And one can see that uh, John really struggles how to put uh, in words what he saw. And there are many um, expressions like um, uh, comparing uh, things uh, with some other thing that uh, his readers are familiar with. This uh, Greek word horse means like similar, like, so it's, it's not very easy for him to formulate what he saw. And uh, I, I think that it was really a vision that was given to him uh, with the task that he would write it down. So it is already mentioned in uh, verses 11 in chapter 1. So the, the, the task is already not just to uh, just to see and contemplate, but to mm, to give it further, to transmit it to the communities. Is it? A, do you see a parallel with mo the way that Moses received that revelation of the of the types in heaven? Is that John having a similar experience to Moses? Is, is what I'm asking. Do you do you see that? Do you, do you agree with that? Well, it is d difficult to be uh, totally sure. So there are so many references to Old Testament figures. Uh, indeed, uh, for, for that, I, I cannot give a definite answer right now. Uh, but uh, it is possible, among other uh, models, for example, the book of uh, Exodus is very uh, important for the book of Revelation, but also book of Daniel, book of right. Isaiah. So he draws re really much upon them, even according to their structure. And yeah, could be this parallels because he, he sees what basically Moses has seen and Ezekiel and Daniel. So he really understands himself in line with those prophets. And um, it's not um, a coincidence that uh, he calls himself a prophet and uh, his book is called the prophecy, the word of prophecy. Uh, so I think he, it, it, it is there as well, but you know, uh, the researchers uh, have counted uh, so many allusions to the Old Testament text, like from 200 till 600. Can you imagine that in one single verse, there could be so many, like five, right. <laughs> five um, allusions uh, together. So it's really amazing how deftly John has combined the Old Testament text because maybe he, he was seeing what he already had read, had uh, contemplated in the Old Testament text. And he also used uh, the imagery to convey uh, what he saw. So this was probably a stepwise process. So firstly, seeing Revelation of God, then uh, contemplating on it, relating it to other Old Testament uh, sources that uh, he uh, revered so much. And then he um, produced literary work very skillfully in terms of literary um, work because uh, scholars see many uh, sections uh, in, in the apocalypse, so, for example, connected with number seven very um, significantly. And uh, each uh, smaller section is uh, somehow connected uh, to the uh, subsequent one and to previous one through little keywords, through little shifts that are also very thought over. And this is just amazing, the literary quality of the apocalypse. And there are so many uh, books and articles about the composition because the, the, there could be different views on how exactly this work is structured. For example, how the series of uh, uh, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls are related. Many views that uh, express different thoughts, but nevertheless, it is very clear in the uh, scholarly tradition that uh, this work is really uh, thought over composition, very deftly, skillfully made. So when you're saying, uh... 
it is a prophecy. Uh, first of all, oftentimes people see a kind of, um, they see a prophet of God in their mind, at least. They imagine someone who is just standing there and receiving uh, almost like a, you know, a direct message that goes down from, from above, from beyond. And uh, they just sort of recite whatever, almost like channeling type of perception of the um, um, genre, I guess, of uh, that we would call prophetic prophecy or, or revelation of, or a reception of prophecy and uh as you're pointing out here is that uh, uh from very very uh deep analysis of the text uh and we're seeing that it's it's a work that is uh processing uh certain visions and certain experiences but it isn't something that's just put down verbatim into uh mm -hmm. written format right is that what uh you're explaining here yeah, exactly exactly so it, it doesn't mean that uh this work is just uh, made from the mind uh, so it, definitely some religious experience is the basis of it but it was really created with literary skill and we should uh, give a uh, uh, honor to the author for this, for this you know, brilliancy, basically, in, in doing it. And yeah, I, I think that it's very important to um, break this stereotype about the prophets who are just uh, channels um, transmitting the word of God as uh, they heard it and not really giving anything from their own. Uh, I think uh, if that would be the case, then all the books of the Old Testament prophets would uh, have the same style. And this is <laughs> not so. That's when you even read it in the translation, it's obvious that they use different words. Uh, they stress different aspects of revelation. And uh, for example, Hosea brings out his experience of his unfaithful wife, so even biographic features and uh, what, what uh, images do they use. It, it's so different that um, it very clearly shows that uh, it was a, not a monologue of, of God, but a dialogue of God mm -hmm. with the person. And so person really have these capacities uh, to creatively transmit the word of God. Maybe like it, it depends yeah. how you how you hear it depends on what you are. And uh, it's really beautiful mm -hmm. that we can trace it as researchers in different Old and New Testament texts. So what, what, what is dear for the author? What is his issue? And it, it also connects uh, it to the, connects the author to the immediate cultural historical context. Talking about the prophets, Father Vladimir, can you uh, quote verse 3 of chapter 1? Uh, yes. Um... Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. I want uh, to emphasize that uh, the author speaks about keeping the words of the prophecy. And if uh, the prophecy would be meant in a sense of just a prognosis of future events to come, then it could be meaningless to keep what is written because you can just know or don't know what the future will look like. So you don't have any direct influence on it. But John uh, wants to communicate a valuable message to his readers, also a moral one and theological one. And this was the task of uh, also Old Testament prophets that were addressing the audiences, speaking not about some remote, uh, distant events, but about what, what can people do to bring good future, um, full of life, uh, full of blessing of God, and uh, w w what they should avoid uh, to not uh, come into a, a disaster. So this is um, the key mission of the prophets, as uh, the Bible understands it, that prophets could transmit the will of God to people and uh, wait and, and prompt them to an active response, not some time, but here and now. And uh, this is very important to John as well. And uh, as the uh, Old Testament prophets, uh, as Old Testament prophets were appearing to the nation in very troublesome periods uh, when the choice of everyone could have an impact on the history, uh, the, the, the atmosphere of uh, the 
John's community was also very, very vibrant, very, very uneasy, so to say. We can, uh, for example, remember Jeremiah who prophesied uh, about Babylonian exile and saying that, that you can still have uh, a choice, still have an impact on your life, just obey Babylonian king and this exile would not happen. So God will just remove the punishment that he have uh, that he has um, uh, sealed uh, according to the sins of the people. So God is open to an active dialogue with the humankind, with everyone, and he waits a uh, good response for the people. Uh, Father Vladimir, may we, quote, may we quote from Jeremiah chapter 18? Uh, yes. Jeremiah chapter 18, 7 to 10. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice then i will relent concerning the good with which i said i would defend it yeah so the point i want to make is this openness of god and uh, the ability of people to choose their way and god is really preparing the salvation for the people but if the, the, they sin it blocks the good will of the lord and um, an interesting example is the book of jonah uh, providing a tale about the prophet announcing punishment and uh, disaster on the nineveh but when the people actively repent, then the disaster doesn't happen. So this plot uh, is an illustration of what we heard from Jeremiah. And John also addresses a particular audience and, say, and says that uh, they should be more active in their faithful relationship with God. The book of Revelation is an encouragement as well as denouncement of evil, denouncement of a compromise with evil structures. And I think uh, th this twofoldness uh, is also present in Old Testament prophecies, as we heard from Jeremiah, uh, to build and to plant and to destroy. So something evil and uh, pernicious should be indeed destroyed in the soul of everyone in order to make space, make room for the new, a new loving relationship with God. So that's what was uh, the task of prophets in, in the Old Testament times and also in the New Testament times. So not, not only um, announcing of bad things to come, not only encouragement, but both. And uh, the main point was also always the openness to God. Uh, well, uh, if we speak of uh, Apocalypse, first of all, um, with a lot of reference to the Old Testament, we also definitely recognize that it, it well, it's it, by the fact it is the book, it is a book uh, written in the uh, after the coming of Christ. So it's a, chronologically, uh, it's a book of uh, the New Testament. Um, could you speak a little more about the time? Uh, uh, that it was written, did, did it have a severe bearing on um, the book's message? Uh, and um, how does it resonate with uh, our life in, in a way that uh, it speaks to, um, to a human being living uh, not in a historic uh, dimension of the past, but in a, uh, a current present, realities that sometimes may have some re uh, resemblances of the periods uh, that uh, have influenced the creation of this book or the, the time it was given in, uh, to, to humanity. Yeah, thank you, Father Vladimir. This is exactly 
uh, how the interpretive path unfolds. So in order to understand the meaning of the book for us, we should go back into the past and see how was it directed to the audiences, to the living issues, to burning problems that were occupying their minds and uh, or then it will be much easier to us to understand the message of the book that is beyond all, all times. Uh, indeed, um, we, we can counter now <laughs> another stereotype that uh, is quite widespread, namely that the Book of Revelation consists only of visions and images, just something as we have already discussed that John saw in heaven and uh, he wrote down. Uh, it's not the case. We can read chap uh, chapter 1, verse 10 till 11. So the, the, there we will see what the audience of John were. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Theatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Yeah, thank you, Father Vladimir. So, uh, speaking about historical circumstances in which this book has appeared, one cannot overlook this statement that this book has particular audiences, so seven church communities that were situated in Asia Minor, and unfortunately, we don't have any precise indications related to the time when it was, but we have already an ancient source that uh, we can rely upon. So this is second century famous author Irenaeus of Lyon, uh, which says that Apocalypse was seen um, towards the end of the reign of Emperor Domitian, that is um, 95 um, uh, 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 AD, so towards this, the end of the first century, common era. And uh, scholars are looking for internal evidence in this book. They see that there are actually much evidence in favor of this opinion. So we can relate to external opinion and see internal indications in the text, which uh, really corroborate uh, what Irenaeus of Lyon says. Uh, yeah, indeed, the situation that the seven churches uh, see uh, around them really corresponds to what historians know about the end of the first century. We can also derive our information from chapters two and three, which are uh, particularly directed to each of the seven churches. So there we can see also kind of a context of their lives, although it is not very elaborated uh, how the situation of seven churches is described and uh, more impact is given to their spiritual state and not any uh, kind of historical situations. Still, there is um, much evidence that can be derived from this. And uh, there we see that uh, seven churches have uh, difficulties, uh, uh, internal ones uh, in their communities and external ones as well. And uh, this is connected somehow to uh, local tensions um, between the, them and authorities. And uh, for example, Church of Smyrna is uh, envisioning time of persecution. And in per Pergamon, there is already one person named Antipas who was martyred, who was killed uh, for the sake of witness of Jesus. And John himself is sent uh, to the island Pathmos, he says, for the uh, sake of uh, uh, word of God and testimony of Jesus, verse 9. So th th this could be also some kind of persecution. And uh, we don't see any wider scale persecution, uh, not, not so much cruelties, uh, but still the atmosphere is uh, full of tensions. And uh, in the letters to the seven churches, uh, it's also mentioned that the churches were struggling with the 
Jewish um, neighbors and uh, some uh, pagans. So th there were accusations and tensions between them. Um, and uh, in, inside s several churches, there were people who would like to compromise with the pagan society and adopt idolatry and uh, fornication, meaning probably the relations with foreign uh, gods, with Asia Minor um, gods. So, uh, if we compare it, uh, what we see in the text with the historical information, then we will see a very clear pattern. Uh, because uh, in the book of Acts, which is dated um, earlier than the book of Revelation, the picture is very different. So, there are no tensions, no conflicts between Christians and Roman authorities. Only conflicts with the Jews are mentioned. So, Roman authorities apparently understand Christianity as an offshoot of Judaism, so they don't really distinguish between them. And Apostle Paul can really be glad that he's a Roman citizen and uh, make use of his uh, good relationships with Romans. And uh, he relied very much on Roman infrastructure in his missionary work. So it was a very positive view on uh, empire uh, that um, epistles of Paul have as well as Book of Acts. But in the Book of Revelation, picture is different because already 64, a common era, uh, Emperor Nero has created a huge persecution of Christians uh, in Rome due to the fire of Rome. So Christians were blamed uh, on the fire, although apparently Nero himself has uh, initiated this. And uh, it was a very shocking experience apparently for Christians that suffered innocently and they were uh, there was time separated from Jews because uh, Roman Empire tolerated uh, religions uh, which were appropriate, which were coming from nations. So the Jewish nation has its own religion and Romans did not, did not interfere with it. But uh, Christianity was open to every nation. And for Romans, it was very, very strange and suspicious. And also this night gatherings of Christians were um, considered as something uh, maybe not really <laughs> according to the laws. Romans were really um, sensitive towards any kind of uh, appraisals, any kinds of um, conspiracy against the uh, dominion of the empire. So, it, and Christians, uh, towards the end of the first century, they really sensed this suspicion, uh, which uh, after a while resulted in larger scale persecutions, apparently. But what was the main source of these tensions and persecutions? It, it appeared, indeed, towards more the end of the first century, namely the cult of Roman emperor. So that was the key issue uh, that um, Christians suffered from in those times, because Roman Empire encompassed huge, vast amount of territories, and there should be some ideological schema that uh, could unite the nations under Roman rule and could allow the citizens to bring homage to Rome. So kind of a sign that they could uh, make in order to show their loyalty. Uh, and uh, this uh, was uh, the cult of Roman emperor. So um, some formal uh, thing that could express their gratitude for Romans uh, peace and uh, uh, good uh, uh, good opportunities to have uh, trade, to be safe, uh, so to uh, live in uh, very good um, and uh, uh, very good infrastructure. Uh, so um, for pagans, it was not really. Um, a problem because uh, the border between human and divine, it wasn't very clear, it was blurred because Greek and Roman gods could come down to, to earth and uh, take on human form and even marry uh, women so that hero, <laughs> hero appeared like um, you know, 
Heracles. So it, it wasn't a problem to call someone God for them, but for Christians it was crucial because they really revered one God, unique God that manifested himself as a living God in the Old Testament, a creator God. And the Lord could not be any human, but the Lord was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So there is one God and one Lord, as Apostle Paul says in Romans. And Christians could not reconcile so easily with these demands. But for a pagan uh, system, it was a very legitimate demands. And if you do not have, if you are not happy with them, then it means that you are either an atheist or a um, very, very suspicious person, potentially an enemy of the state. So this is, was re really, really um, difficult situation that Christians of those times were um appearing in would you say that apocalypse uh the book uh the revelation was a kind of a uh, answer to that situation or was a was it a uh reaction was it uh, what purpose did it serve uh for the communities that it was given to by god and uh written down and presented by saint john yeah i think uh john was uh, feeling very much obliged to give a response to this kind of situations, maybe not, not the situations as such, but these fears and a feeling of uncertainty that permitted his audience. Uh, apparently, he really knew all the members of this seven church community quite well, and he knew uh, his um, internal situations. So he felt as his duty to address these fears, these doubts, and maybe this unfaithfulness uh, partially uh, from some of the members, this, this uh, willingness to compromise and to deny Christian well, faith. Well, there is obviously a sense, uh, uh, we can imagine, there was a sense of despair and uh, mm -hmm. a kind of um, disillusionment, maybe uh, doubt, fear that people would um, face these very um, existential questions and spiritual crises would come upon them if their God is so powerful that I think Christian people have faith, uh, people of faith in general have faced uh, over time and time again when uh, they're being prosecuted, we're being, they're mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. slaughtered or tortured, and uh, especially when they come into a clash with uh, social power and the power of Roman Empire at the time was absolute. Mm -hmm. um, and their belief uh, somehow forces them, as you've described so well, to uh, literally stand uh, uh, in a position, as it seems, at least to the authorities that didn't maybe care to go deep into Christian theology by mm -hmm. that. At that yeah. time, it was so highly uh, misunderstood, unknown, or it, it didn't really, they didn't really care to bother with i mean there were so many as you've mentioned there are so many cultures and religions to begin with so who cares and who is going to go into all of the nuances of the new emerging christian faith while they did have of course re respect for the old testament and uh for the tradition of the jews and we know that jerusalem at the time was uh one of the cultural centers of the world with the uh, um exchange of uh, um, uh, pilgrims and uh, at times reaching uh, numbers that would near a million uh, in uh, the time when they gathered in Judea for Pascha, say, and it's another conversation uh, maybe in itself, but just to paint that picture. So mm -hmm. Ju Judean um, uh, religion at the time was respected deeply uh, uh, by some thinkers uh, that were even pagan. Um, of course, it wasn't the religion of the um, of the Roman Empire in any means, and they did have the same issues uh, with worship of the emperor as a as a god. Uh, but somehow Jews still managed to claim their territory in their uh, specific um, denial uh, uh, and uh, given the right not to worship the emperor. Uh, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, the Christians were certainly claiming that they have uh, been um, coming from the same tradition, yet 
uh, they face tremendous crisis of persecution. And uh, mm-hmm. do you think that this book, um, uh, this this work, this this offering of um, consolation uh, to the community's inspiration, um, and, and and it gives a healing to the souls that are uh, going through um, these crises? Yeah, exactly. So it is uh, undeniable that uh, these issues were present, maybe not, in, uh, as I said, on a large scale, but as uh, these sporadical persecutions and uh, martyrdoms. And a uh, v- very heavy experience was that people envisioned that more and more in the future, which actually happened this way, indeed, we know since the second century. And uh, John, uh, wants indeed to uh, so, uh, to give uh, this uh, basis of faith. So to to uh, say um, to answer the question that Jesus Christ is really the Lord, and in which way, how he relates to a Roman emperor, and so it, it's not not comparable at all. Although he his rulership is not seen as you can see Roman emperor on the throne uh, ruling the vast empire, but nevertheless it's. Uh, his rulership of Jesus was given to him by God and this um, is totally different kind of rulership and uh, Apocalypse indeed presents uh, God as a Pantocrator so uh, in English um, having all the power and uh, all, the throne almighty. of God. Yeah, all, almighty. All, almighty. yeah, almighty. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And the key, uh, one of the key images of the book is the throne of God. It permits the entire narrative, so it uh, appears in many chapters in a row. And uh, this is also a kind of um, reassurance to the readers that even if you see a lawlessness around you and you suffer uh, for, for the sake of your faith, for the sake of good things, uh, nevertheless, God Almighty is in control, and there is a throne of God in the universe, is the center of the universe, and God will manifest His justice. Maybe not immediately, not right now, but God sees everything that you are going through, and this heavenly perspective really transforms the perception of reality that the members of the seven churches uh, had, and uh, this uh, powerful visionary world that John creates uh, was meant to be a counterpart of a Roman propaganda. So this was really very important because uh, Roman propaganda permitted uh, the daily life of the people in terms of uh, um, what they saw around them. So this uh, huge, beautiful temples, very attractive ceremonies of emperor cults, uh, this uh, luxuries that uh, Rome as city and Roman officials possessed. So this kind of bright uh, richness of Rome and this uh, ideology of a Roman majesty should be, you know, countered by also a strong means Yes, in, in terms of how, how you um, stru- how you structure, how you form- formulate your message. I think that if John would have written um, just a theological discourse saying these things, you know, like Apostle Paul, it wouldn't produce such a strong impact on the readers who were uh, seeing these realities around them. And, uh, you know, this music, yeah, this um, sense of the ceremonies. So all, all their senses were affected in a very multiple way and so John wants to create the universe that would also affect the readers in a powerful way mm-hmm. uh, and this is like it uh, one scholar said a therapy for the believers not to lose their faith not to um, give in to this um, elaborated propaganda and to uh, keep the core of their faith so still believe in Jesus and if uh, the mm-hmm. things around them seem to be hopeless then there is still hope uh, in it's God. very amazing uh, how uh, Lord M- Almighty manages to uh, use uh, the power of um, a vision and imagination as it's dispensed through this one um, prophet of God uh, mm-hmm. in uh, just a very limited sense of of an influence, if you will. It's a it's an information. 
again, uh, we're talking a lot about information war right now as mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're living in a um, uh, conflict uh, era and we're living in an information age. Uh, it's become clear that w wars are fought in the minds of the people. Um, yeah. And uh, the uh, uh, it, it seems like uh, we, we see the power of the message of the vision and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Lord chooses to use these faculties of imagination of human imagination, human capacity, that is a gift of God as well. And it's almost like he uses his own, uh, I mean, uh, the, forgive me, the mon mundane uh, analogy, but like it's it's like a, a, a an independent uh, VPN, like a YouTube channel that mm -hmm. comes on that has no censorship and no ability to be controlled uh, because mm -hmm. it simply spreads as a, uh, as a message that uh, has through such limited uh, material uh investments so you don't have to build these uh you know statues of the emperor that are you mm -hmm. know size of a 10 story house uh, and yeah. make them hold and build coliseums that are you know this stadium size uh spectacle uh, arenas and 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 on and on and on with investment of so much power and uh so much wealth and so much effort uh that is uh, incalculable um as we see the the structures of the roman cities and their uh generally the theaters and arenas would occupy uh, territories that, uh, you know, be like a qu qu quarter of the actual city itself. So yeah. the mass propaganda worked in in these uh, material um, tools that, that, that re again, are very, very expensive. And yet God comes in with uh, just a message of word and image uh, that over tips uh, the scales of this uh, matter of this of this uh, worldly power with just uh, these um, these absolutely immaterial um, tools or, or mm -hmm. means, and that I think is just a, a remarkable and, and amazing. Um, as is all that happens through Christ in in Christ's um, power that manifests and changes the entire uh, universe of the time by the means of, so to say, uh, in simple terms, 12 apostles that change the entire world and transform the future yeah, exactly. of human race. Yeah, indeed, it's, it's uh, indeed amazing. Because um, w w although it's immaterial, just 22 chapters, a small book, basically, but it has such force in it, such visual capacity to, um, g to uh, accommodate you in this created world and to transform your perception of reality that it continues to influence minds of the people already for many centuries, you know, almost 2000 years. So that this, uh, what kind of power was uh, given by the Holy Spirit to this book. So indeed, when, and when we uh, learn at least uh, something about the historical situation, uh, then we can indeed uh, appreciate what, what uh, kind of book it was. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's interesting also to mention that in particularly in Asia Minor, the cult of emperor was more elaborate, was more important. It was initiated even earlier than throughout the empire and the citizens of Asia Minor were, were really eager to promote the cults. It wasn't imposed on them, but also that they willingly participated and they like show their loyalty and their gratitude to the mighty emperor. And this is why uh, for, for those contexts, John, created by the power of the Holy Spirit, something as mighty as what was um, around them by so many uh, resources of the empire, so much investment. Just like as, mm -hmm. as we read, I was in in the spirit on the Lord's Day. And with that begins the description of how it really uh, came about. So uh, there is no doubt that this is a, uh, a revelation of the Holy Spirit uh, to humanity that it continues it keeps the gift that keeps on giving right we're living mm -hmm. uh, uh through centuries as you mentioned and may uh as long as we're permit per, we have god's uh, will to continue live as humanity in this world uh, i believe that this book will uh continue to be re relevant uh eternally um and um as the um as as we look at the um 
the study of this book, um, what would you say um, would be important um, to understand in in this book uh, in a way of finding the message uh, of hope that you uh, that the book carries that you are are highlighting. Mm-hmm. Um, we always hear about the hope, faith, and love as this sort of triadic understanding that you know mm-hmm. that basically comprise uh, the essence of uh, our faith and everything that it, we believe to be good and true. And even some people have described um, heaven in in theology as a domain of faith, hope, and love, uh, and hell as a domain where those things are truly absent, um, and um, not in a sort of ambiguous sense, but in a real uh, experiential dimension of absence of these things or presence of those things. And yet, hope s- stands central here in in the message of this book, as you deliver it and see it. Could you um, maybe speak about hope as in, in itself? Is it a gift? Uh, is it a um uh, something you need to fight for like uh we know that faith is a gift uh something that we're given in a way we we can't just uh get, get a faith by uh you know one uh some kind of um uh human effort faith is is a gift of god as we understand is hope a gift or is it something that we need to um, to work on uh, is it something that we need to feel, sort of uh, feel with uh, versus faith, where faith again is not something that necessarily has to be based on understanding. We're just uh, again kind of given that sense of faith. Uh, is hope something that requires uh, 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 the synergy? Oh, very interesting questions, Father Vladimir. Thank you. Well, it is not a coincidence probably that uh, this triad initiates with hope. So hope, faith and love. And maybe we in Christian context speak more about uh, faith, of course, and about love originating from God, agape, and less about hope. And um, Apostle Paul mentions it in relation to faith also, somehow they intertwine uh, in the um, epistle to Romans and Epistle to Hebrews, there's this similarity that um, both faith and hope do not see, but in, in, indeed they uh, kind of aspire to what is unseen, so what they don't know for sure. Yeah, so that's what is common to them. But hope is a like a first step because faith uh, is more pronounced a version of hope. So it's like already a step further in your reassurance that there is something that you can rely upon, although you don't see it, you don't grasp it, you cannot. And hope is a uh, initiation. So it, it, what um, is special uh, for hope is it can be always there, even amidst very difficult times, very dark times. Uh, and um, for the apocalypse, as everyone knows, I think uh, it is peculiar to show how much evil is present in the world. So it, it really corresponded to the experience of uh, the Asia Minor churches, like how much injustice and uncertainties, yeah, and so many perversive state of the world that you don't desire, it, you, you want it different way, but it's still it is like this. And hope allows not to lose this um, positive attitude. So it, it is a common a verb, um, common proverb, dum spiro spero in Latin, like as long as I live, as long as I breathe, I can hope. So whatever happens in my way, whatever dark pit I'm inside, I can still maintain this light of hope, a small, like a small candle. And uh, for the apocalypse, uh, it, I always say that uh, its message can be um, summarized by the words of uh, St. John in the gospel, that light shines in darkness, and darkness did not comprehend it. So that's for me, it's like wow. well, also a good version of uh, what hope is. And uh, in particular, Book of Revelation is um, well, not, not only by me <laughs> named the Book of Hope, but oh, by, yeah. by many researchers. 
yeah of so I, that... I do i do believe that this uh, we, we can learn what hope is by reading these scenes of a mighty evil force as the beasts and the dragon and then in the end uh, good powers triumph and uh, god's throne is erected in the new jerusalem so it was all all the time present but it was in heaven and earth was kind of under dominion of evil powers although messengers from above they came down and the witnesses from earth they they do they did speak to the people that were kind of captivated by evil but it, it was just constant battle as john portrays the, the path of the church as very similar to the way of jesus on earth so this so uh, way um witnessing till the cross till death uh, for the sake of good but uh, nevertheless uh, good triumphs and it is the new bright world shines from this uh, dark state amen amen to that mm -hmm. uh and jay will you uh, join yeah no i thought this was a really good introduction um i don't really have any more uh, comments in terms of you know what we've said today i thought it, it was a great uh, overview yeah i guess the, a few words on the idea or this uh hopefully upcoming um format or structure of this project uh we we hoped uh, that we hope uh, that this will continue uh, as a, a series and uh, we don't know exactly it will work out to be how many of these um <clears throat> like it's a lecture series uh, we could say um that's uh, that's structured in a form of uh, discussion and um mainly of course our presenter is uh, veronica is the uh, one of the experts uh, uh, on on the topic of of, of this book in particular that um, we would uh, like to see it go into a sequence of at least twelve lessons um, that uh, are basically reflected in the structure of her book um, and go deeply really in detail into each uh, uh, of the chapters of the book of Revelation. Uh, could you, Veronica, speak a few words? Words about your uh, the well you see to be the uniqueness of your course or the necessity of it okay. and uh, the approaches that you will take in uh, presenting information in the uh, format of this uh, lecture series that will be e interesting, unique, and helpful to our viewers that will choose to to take this course to be part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it is really worthwhile to follow because uh, for all the interested people and also for Christians nowadays, it is useful to be more knowledgeable about our faith and to um, speak uh, for our uh not only for faith but also for our knowledge and there are questions that are asked from uh, external people but also there are questions that uh, are internally present in us for example as i mentioned jesus is the lord so for me it was a question that i would like to discuss and we will not only in this course go verse by verse and not being uh, confining ourselves uh, with the text only but uh, throughout the course we will relate to complex issues that are really interesting and worthwhile to discuss and my approach as i said is a inspirational reading of the apocalypse as book of hope relating it to new testament message about jesus and its church uh, to old testament uh, texts and theology uh, of those times and uh, i would uh, drive upon many literature from all kinds of uh, backgrounds and uh, neatly combining it into an orthodox overview of this book and my approach is um, thematically structured. So uh, as Father Vladimir mentioned, we will be going chapter by chapter, uh, but uh, still we will identify topics in each chapter. So this content-wise approach, which I think is the best for our uh, generation that likes uh, the information to be structured, uh, so very uh, concisely put. So this is what I'm doing in my book as well. And uh, I... Uh, do not ignore this, um, as I said, complex issues. We will discuss them in detail also with the help of Father Vladimir and Jay. Maybe they will challenge my views. So I think it would be also nice uh, in, in uh, a way of a dialogue to uh, speak more on this interesting and 
sometimes problematic, sometimes challenging, sometimes just exciting topics that are related with the book of Revelation. So I'm looking forward to this course and I welcome everyone who is interested, whatever background he has or he or she has. And I think we will make an interesting course based on my book, but maybe going a bit beyond it, of course. So it depends which questions I would receive. So maybe we'll even extend it uh, to something new. But already what, what uh, I have uh, written is very interesting, uh, I would say, <laughs> inspiring maybe, and also uh, providing us with um, uh, more clear understanding of, of New Testament message. So it's not only about one book, it's about the New Testament and theology and church and Jesus and us Thank also. You. All right. Is there anything you want to, uh, we want to leave with before we uh, close out this interview? Well, I would uh, uh, simply like to end it with a verse from Revelations twenty two twenty one that is uh, a blessing in itself. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank, Thank you, Father.